CGTN, China Global Television Network. It is now 25 years since the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, a meeting that saw declarations made to mark a turning point for the global agenda on gender equality. Over two and a half decades on, progress has indeed been made, but at a painstakingly slow pace. Today, more opportunities are open for women in economic activity and education. However, access to health and political empowerment are still poorly performing indicators, according to the World Economic Forum. Regionally, Sub-Sahara and North Africa are lagging behind, with significant structural and cultural barriers standing in the way of faster progress. So what is the status of Africa's gender gap today? And what challenges remain to achieve a gender parity by 2030? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. And to bring us up to speed with the status of Africa's gender gap is Beth Mishoma. She's an advocate of Kenya's High Court and is the chairperson of the Gender Committee at the Law Society of Kenya here in Nairobi. Professor Alina Segiobe is joining us from Bintoki, Namibia. She's the dean of the Faculty of Human Sciences at the Namibia University of Science and Technology. She's joining us via Zoom from Bintoki. And also joining us from Johannesburg is Cheryl Shlabane. She's a social activist and heads the Frida Hartley Shelter for Women and Children. Thank you all for joining us on the program. I want to start by getting an understanding from all of you about the reality of the gender situation in Africa. Let's start off with you, Cheryl Slaban and Johannesburg, because broadly we hear that girls in Africa do not have the same opportunities as, as, as the boys. We hear that, uh, that women uh, you know, are being shut down from jobs because of discrimination. Give us uh, the reality. What is the gender equality situation in Africa today? Thank you so much, Beatrice. Um, it is so sad that in 2020, we still have to fight the rights or for equality for women and girls. Um, you know, you look at things which obviously I'm sure that's also a global issue where you found young girls who skip a period because of a period where we are still fighting to get sanitary wear in school because if girls don't have, especially in impoverished areas or in rural areas where they do not have um, adequate sanitary pads, they then skip going to school so they stay at home. So that's another way um, of just, you know, just keeping a girl child at home, which is very disturbing. Um, and you find in instances like our country, condoms are freely distributed in schools, in public spaces. However, the same is not done for women. So, you know, those are some of the issues that we are still uh, fighting for. Uh, you look at the pay gap as well. Um, I come from a recruitment and HR space, so I understand how bad it is where I would recruit for the same position um, and yet the male counterpart will get more money um, as opposed to the female counterpart right. and both of them have the same experience or maybe the female even has better experience or better qualification um, and or if they do give you that particular position they are uh, you are excluded from certain meetings or you are excluded from certain golf games because those are deemed as guy sports or guy um, you know it's, it's, it's for males so you know as much as um, some some people are trying to end um, the gender gap but however they're doing it in the wrong manner so that's just placing a woman in a senior position and thinking they can just tick the box and say okay we've done our part here and then move forward so we are still discriminated in manners where as much as they try and include us and then they then exclude us in certain activities right. or deprive us of the right salary or shut down our voices because we can't say certain things. Uh, Professor Seguiobe, we do know that a lot of uh, progress has been made in the field of education in particularly, but how far are we in terms of uh, equity in the other sections? Thank you for the question. I think um, one needs to put it into a context, and the context that because of the continental diversity, 
it's very hard to get a picture of the entire continent in terms of where progress has been made in what areas. One can speak, for example, to the sub-Saharan context in that quite significant strides has been made in some areas such as legal reform to ensure that women have access in terms of uh, opportunity, especially to fields which were previously male-dominated. If you look at the areas of STEM sciences and education, more young women and girls are going into those fields. And in the world of work, we see more women than girls in those fields. However, if you look at the Maghreb, you may find that there are differences in terms of access to education and opportunity. I would say the greatest reforms that have been made are in the area, especially in the area of the political space. It's not significant, but it's important to know that it has been a little bit better than what has been the case in the last 30 years. We've seen more women come into political office and political activism. However, the numbers are still extremely low, whether you're looking at 30% or 50% parity. We are not yet where the numbers should be, given the commitments that have been made by our states uh, in the continent uh, and also across, of course, the whole world. Some of these pictures mirror what are perhaps global statistics and, and pictures. But I would say some of the areas where gaps are still there it's in those fields that have been traditionally seen as a male fields, again in the STEM fields, engineering, in the area of mining, not enough women have access to, I would say, meaningful work in the sectors of mining, for example. If you look at sectors such as construction, those are still heavily male-dominated uh, areas. So it's important that we look at the broader picture to say we need to be looking at how across various sectors in the world of work, the access to job opportunity, and especially to career sustainability for women has been enabled. And I think these are areas where you'll find that we are lagging behind, right. whether in terms of gaps, in terms of pay equity, or it's in terms of access right. to opportunity and then to be able to deliver in the world of work. Beth uh, Mishoma, I, I want to pick up on where uh, Professor Segiobe has talked about. There has been progress made in the political space. Uh, that is a little bit better. But, but Kenya is uh, currently grappling with a th two-thirds gender equality rule that has not been implemented yet. Uh, Beth, what's your reality? Our reality is we are doing very badly. It has been uh, 10 years since the promulgation of our constitution, which has a two-thirds gender rule. Since then, uh, uh, citizens have been in court basically asking parliament to legislate to ensure that uh, this law is entrenched. However, we've been running around with parliament for those 10 years. We've also, you know, exhausted every space that we can, you know, we can get to ensure that this law is entrenched. And uh, that is why, you know, as a law society, we go to a place where we say, now we're going to dissolve you. If you're not going to be able to legislate on a law that helps women get into spaces, we shall dissolve you. So we are doing very badly, Beatrice. We actually have only 21% of women in parliament. We can't say we are equal at all. At all. Thank you. All right. Um, let, me, let me come back to, to you, um, uh, Cheryl, because South Africa has a history of uh, strong women, particularly in the liberation struggle. But, but when you talk about uh, gender equality today, you seem to emphasize mm -hmm. that there is still a, a major disconnect between um, you know, the gender equality law. So what is missing here? Um, our country is extremely good in putting down policies. Um, our biggest problem is implementing those policies. We have employment equity policies which have to ensure that a certain number of previously disadvantaged um, individuals are placed at senior positions or that women um, are also placed as at those particular positions. But it's not happening um, you know, at, at a rate that it should. Um, it's really at a tortoise rate. And like I said, also, when they do then place you in that position, they disempower you because you are just given the position as a default um, because they have to have somebody who is a woman at a senior position, but you have no decision making. So we need to get to the point where we do take it seriously. 
but also because of, of our cultural norms and traditions a lot of men think that when you empower a woman you disempower a man so the education around that is very very important and therefore we get labeled bad feminist because we are for women but they don't understand that being pro-woman is not against men at all and that we can coexist and that if both women and men work together, I mean, that's obviously something that is great for the economy um, and also good for family environments. Uh, so, uh, you know, you look at uh, countries like um, Ethiopia, you know, who have a female president. Right. So you have young girls there who are so empowered, who now have a, a, a better role model, you know, who can wake up every single day and say, one day I'm going to be president because it is possible, because they can see a female president who's out there, who's also changing um, gender gap norms um, and who is, you know, doing absolutely amazing work and is changing um, the norms around there, changing the narrative around there. So we need such also in our country where even the female representative that we have in parliament or as ministers, they are literally just there because they don't have a voice and they're not advocating for us and they're not fighting for us. We literally have to unify and stand in solidarity as different organization and fight and march and still make noise in order for our president to listen for us or, if the, or even the women in, in, in cabinet. So we still very far behind, even though there are policies and laws that right. are in place, they are not just implemented um, at a rapid place and also just effectively. Right, Professor Segiobe, role modeling has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cheryl is talking about role modeling as one of the ways that can empower the girl child. But, but, but also, of course, we, we, we have to go back to what you mentioned earlier on in terms of Professor Segiobe, in terms of uh, the fields that are still very much male dominated. One has to ask, how do you bridge that gap in those fields that are still very much uh, male dominated? And, and what are the, some of the strongest um, challenges uh, that women are facing to that that keep them from achieving uh, or attaining gender parity okay thank you i think as i was saying the biggest challenge we have is that of political will across all our 54 states you find that most of our leaders do not carry through with the intentions that are there in our everyday life for example the constitution may provide one thing the law reform may enact a law that ensures that women gain better access to something it may be whether it's land rights or something but it takes long to implement those so political will is a very important area where we need to see reform or change secondly i think the issue of resources oftentimes when uh, there are programs that need to be implemented our leadership will highlight the lack of resources if you take the case of education stem education the education of young women and girls or all children really in the sciences on the continent is lagging behind because oftentimes we are told there are not enough resources. However, we do know this is one of the richest continents and it should not be that we have an excuse about it in terms of educating our citizenry. In terms of also a big challenge that is there on the continent is the issue ensuring that there is peace and stability. Oftentimes, the empowerment of human beings, men and women, children, depends on their being stability. Unfortunately, the continent has been plagued by many conflicts. And many of this have led to a situation where many vulnerable people, especially women and children, are not in conditions where they can benefit from education. So people who are totally displaced are unable to take advantage of even the most basic provisions. People in refugee camps don't have the rights of access to basic things such as water, sanitation, and decent housing or decent accommodation. So it, it follows that the biggest impediments are going to be the lack of peace and stability on the continent, the lack of political will. And then even when these are dealt with, enabling changes in cultural norms and practices that will ensure that we are looking at a more just and more equitable and more equity informed approach to treating men and women, females and males equally has to be inculcated in terms of our entire, I would say, DNA, so that we don't see young girls who have a chance to go to school in a peaceful country still being left behind. 
because somebody is not ensuring that at the home level, the community level, they have the enabling environment to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. All right, uh, we'll take a short break now. Uh, we'll be continuing with the analysis on the status of the gender equality in Africa. Do stay with us. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Our panelists are still standing by, joining us via Zoom and in our studios in Johannesburg, Beth Michelle Marie Nairobi, Professor Segiobe in Namibia, and also joining us from Johannesburg is uh, Cheryl Shlabane. Beth, let me get your thoughts here uh, in terms of women accessing high positions uh, uh, in, in government. How does political underrepresentation impact or affect women uh, specifically? How badly off are women left out? Uh, you know, in the decision-making process on the continent? Um, Beatrice, thank you for that question. We have to look at it in context. The fewer women there are in decision-making, the fewer gender equal policies which are going to come through, which means that it is going to affect all women on the continent and uh, basically in my country, Kenya, where we have a representation of 90% uh, perhaps male they will not think about the nitty gritties that would basically bring up their female compatriots. Women are very key. With them, we can ensure that, you know, we get uh, gender equal policies that will uh, have a ripple effect on all the women of the continent. So you serve in the Law Society of Kenya, uh, Beth. Let me get your thoughts here in terms of how you see the legal reforms uh, playing out in the Kenyan scenario. Do you see that as having much impact in uh, uh, assisting in achievement of gender parity? Uh, Beatrice, legal reforms should assist in the achievement of gender equality and parity. However, like I have stated, where women are not involved in decision making, we are going to have at least only a percentage of reforms which can you know, create a ripple effect. What I'm saying is this, if there is underrepresentation where laws are being made in parliament of women, then legal reforms only will uh, basically lead to a, a small change in the way people think in uh, our African continent. All right. So, Professor Segiobe, I want to go back 25 years to the conference in Beijing, the UN Women's Conference in, in, in Beijing, which was hoped that it would mark a turning point in the way the world uh, looked at gender equality. First of all, did it mark a turning point? And, and what has been achieved in terms of women empowerment and equity over the last 25 years? Thank you for that. Uh I think uh, the main achievements that we see were the, I would say, growth of global solidarity for women's movements. Women across the world began to realize that they share a lot of common features in terms of the way they were discriminated in their states. The global north, the um, Southeast Asian countries, then of course our own continent. So I think the biggest gain was that uh, solidarity. And then of course, out of that, the uh, realization of key instruments within the family of organizations, including the UN, leading to the formation of the UN women as a body that actually coordinates or coalesces the voice of women in development across the continent. There were other critical uh, instruments that came to, 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 to be, I'd say, uh, noted, again from uh, Beijing. And this was the eventual enactment of 
UN Resolution 1325 and its antecedents, in other words, the, what, the, the, the change that came after it, the realization that gender-based violence, among other things, is a crime against humanity, which had not really been seen as such. We are still seeing the levels of violence met against women and children, especially the girl child, which were there in previous decades. In the instance of UN Resolution 1325 and its amendments thereafter, we see the great success where a rape as a weapon of war has come in to be used in prosecuting perpetrators. We've seen in the context of the UN right. a growing awareness that peacekeeping bodies do not have a right to violate those that are meant to protect. And we've seen modest gains in terms of bringing to trial those to have been perpetrators of such crimes. But it's not good enough, unfortunately. In terms of, uh, I would say, enhancing the space and breaking the glass ceiling, we're still very far. In some countries, we've seen gains for women in the world of work, where, for example, maternity leave has been enacted as a right of both the, the male and the female parents to ensure that a child who is growing up in the context of a relationship of a, of, of a mother and father both parents have got access, or in, the, in this instance where you have same-sex couples, one of the parents has the right to be able to get leave where the other one is working. So I think these kinds of small modest gains can be seen as some of the most critical gains that we've seen across the continent. And especially on the African continent where work is scarce, unemployment is high. It's important to note that the few opportunities that women have gotten in the world of work have to be recognized as critical gains, especially because they translate into real benefits for families, for children, and where children are able to get access to education, oftentimes you find that the woman in the home is able to take their resources if and through formal or informal employ right. a bit further. So in this instance, the understanding that keeping women in work, in the world of work, or ensuring you create safe space for women in the formal sectors to be able to work has enabled more children to get access to education. As I say, when you educate a woman and educate a girl child, you are able to educate a whole community because from there, those gains translate into benefits for wider societal networks, unlike where, for example, they are kept out of the world of education or world of work. So there is still a lot of uh, progress to be made. So Beth, in terms of uh, the legal aspect though, how much has the world changed when it comes to uh, women empowerment? How much has the world changed since that Beijing conference? Uh, we are moving up at a particularly slow pace. Yes, there are gains. Uh, most uh, continents have come up you know with plans since the beijing uh, declaration to basically ensure you know women empowerment and girl child empowerment however the issue is implementation for instance the african union has a strategy which binds its members to ensure gender equality but you can see through the various countries in africa that the implementation is pretty slow in fact, I would say we are kind of rolling back the gains that you know we gained from the Beijing conference. For instance, like Professor Segovia said, violence against women, it's becoming even harder to exist as a woman in society right now. During the COVID period alone, there have had to be various campaigns in regards you know, to stopping gender-based violence of which women are the main victims of. And if you look at it, we are going back. We are really going back. I would have wished that, you know, we would have been further, but uh, where reports are coming out that, you know, you have 95 uh, years from now to ensure that, you know, gender equality uh, or gender parity is felt, then we have really gone back. My expectations 25 years from the conference would have been that we would have been much further with women you know, having a larger share in the political and decision-making spaces. You know, we think like gender-based violence having reduced significantly, instead they've gone up with issues like, you know, stereotyping of women in the media being non-existent. But this is not so. I believe after 25 years, uh, we've gone at a snail pace. Thank you. All right. So, uh, 
uh, Professor Segiobe, I I'm looking at the global gender gap report of uh, 2020, which uh, indicates that in terms of a gender parity, Iceland uh, remains the top country for achieving that, and that is for the 11th year uh, running. When it comes to global trends, though, we are not seeing much uh, of Africa featuring. So can gender parity be achieved in Africa, and, and how can we address the deficiencies on the continent? Thank you for that question. I think, uh, yes, indeed, uh, Iceland is a standout example, as perhaps uh, cited would be Norway or several countries in Scandinavia. It, it, and it, it, it begs the question, what did they do right that we are not doing right as a continent? I think in the main, as has been said by Beth, legal reform is absolutely critical, but it follows that implementation should follow the reforms. So I think those countries that were able to see modest success or good success were able to not only carry through with legal reform, but also implementation. If you look at Norway, they went for a 30% or towards 50% uh, representation, and they achieved that by enacting laws and implementing those laws. On the continent, the biggest challenge remains that of political will. But I'd say political will is not on its own a causal factor. There are many other, I'd say, drivers of why we're not realizing uh, gender parity. The continents, uh, I would say, conflicts, as I've highlighted before, and those conflicts, we must bear in mind, are not only um, responsible, or the responsibility is not only from the continent itself. There are external factors, external drivers of those conflicts on the continent. We need to address those. In the instance of the conflicts that are there on the continent, the issue of arms trade, the issue of small arms infiltrating the continent, gangs in South Africa, for example, how do we end up with so many small arms in the hands of gangs who are able to terrorize within the children and families? It's because somewhere there are loopholes in the entire ecosystem of law and security enforcement. So I think in terms of what we need to do as a continent, is first have a very clear understanding in terms of the vision of the continent, of the agenda of peace, and when we mean security, you must ensure that even in terms of inclusion, women are critically included in those spaces where right. peace negotiations, peace building, right. post-conflict peace is being negotiated. Beyond that, the rebuilding of those fragile or broken states has to include women in the agenda. Unfortunately, oftentimes they are often brought after the fact. They must be part of the critical stages of negotiating for peace, rebuilding peace, and then, of course, the reconstruction, and then, of course, resource distribution. Oftentimes, women are left out of the way in which resources are distributed. If you look at ministries of finance, there are very few countries where the minister of finance is a woman. And that is where the economies of the continent are driven from. Ministries that look after minerals, for example, which is some of the biggest uh, income earners for the continent's countries, there you will not find women represented. So even the issue of how women are given portfolios and governments by leading heads of states is critical to look at. To leave it there for the moment. That's all we have time for this week. Thank you to our guests for their insights. Beth Mishoma, an advocate of Kenya's High Court and the chairperson of the Gender Committee at the Law Society of Kenya. And Dr. Alina Segiobe is the Dean, Faculty of Human Sciences at the Namibia University of Science and Technology in Windhoek. Cheryl Shilabane in Johannesburg, a social activist and head of the Frida Hartley Shelter for Women and Children, unfortunately had to leave the discussion earlier in the program. Remember to follow the conversation online through our social media handles on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube displaying on your screens. And be sure to catch us again next week on Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall, it's goodbye.